So welcome, everyone. So welcome to our professorial inaugural lectures for 2023. My name is Professor Nancy Kula, and I am the Dean, Executive Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, and I'm a professor of linguistics in our Department of Language and Linguistics. And it's wonderful to have you here in person and also those, of our, those who are joining us live today on YouTube. So this is the 10th anniversary of our prestigious lecture series, and these lectures are a highlight of our academic year, giving us a chance to come together to celebrate the world-leading research talent here at the University of Essex. Tonight, we will have a chance to hear from three outstanding academics from the Institute of Social and Economic Research and the Department of Sociology in our Faculty of Social Sciences, which is widely recognized as one of the UK's very strongest centers for research in, and education in social sciences. We are very proud to be one of only two universities in the UK to be ranked in the top 10 for research quality for sociology, economics and econometrics, and politics and international studies, according to the government's Research Excellence Framework 2021. When we add to this a top 10 ranking for a fourth social science subject, modern languages and linguistics, that distinguished position within the UK uh, social sciences becomes unique. These professorial inaugural lectures are, de are designed to inspire and perhaps challenge our thinking while celebrating our excellence in research. You see all of the qualities of our unique Essex research mindset demonstrated by our world-class academics speaking tonight, the powerhouse of three women, Professor Birgitta Rabe, Professor Roisin Ryan Flood, and Professor Anna Sergi. Our first professor presenting this evening is Professor Birgitta Rabe from the Institute of Social and Economic Research, ISA. ISA was originally established in 1989 at the University of Essex to house the British Household Panel Survey. ISA has grown into a leading center for the production and analysis of longitudinal studies. It encompasses the ESRC Research Center for Microsocial Change and the successor to the British Household Panel Survey, Now Understanding Society, the largest study of its kind in the world. As well as providing unrivaled postgraduate study opportunities, ISA is also home to the internationally renowned Center for Micro Simulation and Policy Analysis. <coughs> professor Birgitta Rabe is a professor of economics. She received her PhD in economics at the Free University uh, Berlin in 1999 and worked at the Social Science Center Berlin and taught at the Ruhr University Bochum before joining Essex. Birgitta has held grants from the Nuffield Foundation and the Economic and Social Research uh, Council and is a co-investigator on the ESRC Center for Microsocial Change. During the COVID-19 pandemic, she has led two rapid response projects investigating the impact of the pandemic on educational inequalities and on family well-being. Her research focuses on children's human capital development, the role of parental and public investments into children, and how these investments interact. Currently, she's focusing on interventions such as free school meals, weight report cards for children, private tutoring, and school exclusions, and asks how they impact parents and children's behaviors and ultimately children's outcomes and how this differs by family backgrounds. Please welcome Professor Rabe. Thank you. Thank you and um, good evening. Thanks for coming. I'm excited to be presenting here in front of family and friends and colleagues and I don't know who else is here. Um, my topic for tonight is childhood inequality and because I'm an economist I can't do this without actually um, showing a graph first of all. Um, let me just get this going. Right, um, so this graph shows um, attainment gaps in school between children from disadvantaged backgrounds, children um, who are eligible for free school meal because their parents are on qualifying benefits or because they are in care and everybody else. And what you can see there is that, um, right, I didn't have the microphone. Um, I hope you could still hear me. 
uh, what you can see is that even before compulsory schooling starts at the end of reception year, um, disadvantaged children are already um, more than four months progress behind um, other children. And this gap only widens as they get older. By the end of primary school, it's nine months. By the end of secondary school at age 16, it's 18 months. And um, why is this important? Well, we know that education is linked to really important later life outcomes, such as what you earn, um, what jobs you hold, who you marry, uh, where you live, um, how healthy you are, and eventually also when you die. So, it, you know, educational gaps are something that we're really concerned about. So going on to my um, research agenda, um, I, I look at the circumstances, interventions, and policies that shape children's human capital development. And human capital, as economists, we think about it broadly. It's, it's not just the cognitive skills, it's also social skills, health, and, and things like those. And in that, I'm interested in uh, the role of parents and the parental background, but also what public uh, interventions can do. So things like school, preschool, and, and other policies that might be around. And I'm quite interested how these two things interact with each other. And I think in the course of my talk, you will, you will see what I mean by that. And um, in the background of, of all of these things that I'm looking at, I'm always interested in how things affect um, inequality between children. And this is the perspective I'm going to take today as well in, in what I'm going to talk about. So um, these are a few projects that I've been looking at over the last years. Um, I've, I've put it into two separate blocks, the early years from birth to the end of primary school, where parental inputs start really early with breastfeeding, for example. And then there are some topics, um, let's say, in secondary school that I've been interested in. And uh, tonight, I want to focus on three examples of what I've done, tell you a little bit what I've found and what the implications are for these gaps that I showed you um, in the beginning. First of all, I'm going to talk about siblings. Um, siblings are quite similar in many respects because they share a lot of things. I'm looking at my children here. Um, <laughs> They have um, shared genes, they have often shared parents, live in the same place, share the neighborhood, often go to the same school. So they have a lot in common. And the thing that interests um, me is, is there, uh, over and above that, is there a direct influence of the older sibling uh, to the younger. And uh, you might imagine that that's quite difficult to find out empirically, but as economists, we have a toolbox that we can go to. We work our magic, and um, the short answer is here, yes. The achievement of the older sibling spills onto the younger. So if the older has, um, is better by a grade, 10% of that advantage also spills over to the younger. Why, why might that be? There might be role modeling going on, like good stud study skills, direct teaching, or anything like that. So when we first um, published this research, a few newspapers were intrigued, and I think this is because there are, um, the topic of siblings is kind of interesting. We all know prominent siblings, and we all have siblings, or many of us have siblings ourselves. So on the photo on the right-hand side, this is my oldest sister leading us in brushing our teeth in a Swedish lake. I'm the little one on the right-hand side that looks like a boy. Um, but apart from, from these, from these uh, trivia, as I said, I'm going to talk about inequality. So the reason to be interested in this topic in the first place is, not, is, is um, to see what happens in terms of educational transmission. So I'm going to start with the good news is, um, and this is that um, spillovers are larger for higher than low attaining uh, siblings. Why is that good news? It means that if you have a well attaining older siblings that spills over more than having one that uh, is not interested. So that's kind of good. And uh, the other bit of good news is that this is the same across um, backgrounds. So you might think, um, does this happen in all types of families? This may differ. No, we find it's quite uh, similar between low and, and high income families. Um, so that's kind of nice. If you have a, a, a high attaining older sibling, you, you get the benefit. Um, the less good news is that children in low income families are much less likely to have an, a high attaining older sibling. And so being born into a low income family means if you, you know, we're looking at the composition of all of this in, the, in England, and we find that just by being born in a low income family, 
your um, attainment actually lowers, whereas um, those in the high income family, their attainment goes up. And this explains 8.4% of the attainment gap that I showed you at age 16. Um, so there's a, an externality here, as we call it in economics, which is good for, the, for those um, in high and bad for those in low income families. And as policymakers, you might think, okay, what are we going to do? If we invest a lot of help into um, the low attaining students, then this could help uh, children in, in the low income families. But as we have seen, the spillovers are, are lower for the low attaining. So from an efficiency point of view, you want to invest in the high attainers. We have an equity efficiency trade-off, something we see quite often, and policymakers have to decide where they sit in between that. So that was my siblings. The next thing I'm going to talk about is parental engagement with um, how students learn. Um, in terms of how we think about um, a, ch a child's development, we say that um, both schools and parents invest into children. By that we mean the schools, the schools do the teaching or they give the PE lessons or they cook the school dinners. And at home equally, um, the children are nurtured in some shape or form um, and um, parents might guide them, might help them with their homework and their learning. Um, and the question that is quite interesting to ask here is if, um, if the schools do more and better let's say you have the fantastic teachers and they do more, what do the parents then sub subsequently do? Because this might not be independent, right? They might see, oh, this is all being done in school, I won't do any more. Or they might say, um, oh, the school is so stimulating, let's add to this in some way. And this is a really important question for public policy because in the one scenario, you're kind of undoing what the school is investing. In the other scenario, you are adding to it. So it's important to know and under what circumstances these um, things develop. So what we are doing in this piece of research, we're looking at Ofsted um, uh, inspections, which are very stressful, um, I think, for teachers. And um, parents often know the quality of the school, obviously, but there is an element of surprise. Our Ofsted was this. And so we're looking at this um, element of surprise. And if the parents learn that the school is better or worse than they thought, how do they, act, they react in terms of their own helping with homework at home? Um, and what we find is um, that parents who receive good news about school quality reduce their own effort. So in a sense, um, they are undoing what the schools are offering. They're undoing that investment. Not good news for public investment, really. And this is actually driven by the higher educated and the non-white households, who are often the more aspirational households. Um, so the implications for in inequality, which is my underlying question that I'm asking tonight, um, is quite interesting because um, we have this asymmetry if there's good news, you, do less, you, you help less with homework. If there's bad news, um, you don't do much. And for that reason, um, these offset inspections actually lead parents overall, if you look at the whole population, to do less. And, um, and because <coughs> of the way that offset results are nested within schools, um, we also see that the inequality in, in inputs at home gets less. Um, the only thing is, so here we have kind of an intervention that lowers inequality, but not in the way that we want, because it's almost a race to the bottom. Everyone's kind of, we're, we're having less help at home. Um, so the question, this is the, the, the Ofsted logo, raising standards, improving lives. I've put a question mark. You might argue, of course, that school accountability is a good thing. It improves um, schools, makes teachers work really hard. And it's good for parents probably to know how good schools are so they can choose. You know, that's why we have this, um, why we are releasing the news. But on the other hand, um, I've just shown you that this might not be good um, and improve lives in all respects. And maybe we have to think hard about how we actually um, transmit this news about what the offset outcome was and how we talk to parents about it and what it means and what should be done. Right, um, I'm already on my third example. And here I'm looking at another aspect of human capital that I haven't talked about before. 
um, which is health. That's another dimension. And specifically, I'm going to look at obesity. And the graph I'm showing here, another graph, um, is a little bit depressing. And what you see is that over the time since children have been weighed and measured in school, and this is showing obesity rates amongst um, year sixes in school, over the, um, since 2006 until 2018, obesity rates have gone up. But more concerningly, those two blue lines, the bottom one are um, children in the least 20% of um, areas, and the dark blue at the top, most deprived areas. And you see this gap um, is really about a large and increasing. Um, in 2018, children in the most deprived areas were twice as likely to be obese than those in the least deprived. So um, a really concerning gap. And I think we all know that obesity, again, is similar to education, has long-reaching um, implications for people's lives. Um, childhood obesity is adult obesity linked to many morbidities and, uh, and, and um, quality of life, productivity loss, healthcare costs, all the rest of it. We don't really like obesity very much at all. Um, so the policy that we focus on in this one is um, to look at free school meals. And the background to this is that children eat a lot of their da uh, daily calorie intake in school. They spend a lot of time in school, and this is basically where the state can, can grab them and do something, because that's where we, we can get hold of them. Um, since 2008, um, school meals have um, quite high nutritional standards and limits on portion sizes. Some of you may have watched Jamie's um, School Dinners. It was quite an amusing series, and in fact, it has. People say um, these, these school standards have been implemented as a result, amongst others, of this television series. In, uh, by contrast, uh, packed lunches, which is kind of the other thing that children eat at school, aren't that good. Some uh, colleagues of ours uh, have unpacked school lunches, brought in, and found that only 1% actually comply with um, the school food standards. And 30% of them have what's in the picture here, a sweet, a sugary drink, and a, a packet of crisps in them. One third of lunch boxes. I find that quite shocking. But um, so from that point of view, and yeah, free school meals historically, as, as many of you know, were only given to low income children. Um, so because of the difference in the quality of the packed lunch and the school dinner, it might be that providing school dinners actually is good, um, could improve obesity rates amongst children. And um, we have two uh, different examples that we study. The first one is the universal infant free school meal policy, where children receive free meals implemented in 2014. Children receive free meals in the first three years of school. Um, and then we're also studying local authority schemes in London, uh, which started as kind of pilot schemes earlier. And many of you will have read recently in, in the last few days that uh, from September 2023, the whole of London is giving free meals to children in primary school. Um, so what do we find? Um, this is, this is um, an article that came out when we first, first published our results. So the headline finding is at the top there we find that free meals, in fact, do reduce obesity rates amongst reception children, which is when uh, weight is measured, um, by 7%. Now, this number isn't huge, but um, um, many of you will know that obesity is something that is very sticky, very, very hard to shift. Things like making children run a daily mile in the playground or educating them on, on five a day and all of that hasn't really made much difference. So seeing something that does make a difference to children's weight really is quite exciting, even if the effect isn't huge. In the new research on the local authority schemes, we also find similar effects in year seven of similar size. And we can show that those children who have received meals for a consecutive number of years have higher reduction in, in obesity than those who have only eaten in the current year. And we also find that they improve attainment and, and reduce absences a little bit. Now, um, as you, is my, kind of my scheme, I'm going on to the implications for inequality of this. Um, 
This is the Universal Infant Free School Meal, and I'm showing you how um, the take-up um, changed for, for two different groups of people. The, the line at the top is, um, are the children that were free school meal eligible because they historically always got a free meal. And when the policy kicked in in 2014, there was a little uptick of use. Um, maybe it's more fun to eat your school dinner if other people are also having it. But the main uptick in, in, in eating school dinners was about among those that were not previously eligible. Kind of makes sense. But it also indicates that the effects that we find are actually driven by these children who, who are not on the low, lowest incomes in the country. It does show that the meals of um, a broad range of children actually, in fact, can be in, in improved and obesity lowered. But in terms of the topic that interests me tonight, the inequality, um, it does mean that this may worsen health inequalities overall because those children in the lowest incomes don't see any difference to what actually is happening to them. So, sorry to be a spoiled sport, but we have to point that out. Um, conclusions. So, what does all of this mean for policy? Um, I would say that there is a strong case for targeting policies to the poorest. But I've also shown that the payoffs may sometimes be higher among the better off. So we have this equity efficiency trade-off that we sort of have to decide as a society where we stand. In some contexts, making policies universal, universal can benefit all or many in different ways. And um, parents can enhance public <laughs> policies, but in the worst case can also undo them. So the success of public policy does rely in, in thinking about how do we actually interact with parents and how do we manage to engage them. And then finally, back to me, what is my future agenda? Where do I want to go? These are the same points I've shown you at the start, but I've experimented with the cloud on PowerPoint and put in some, some buzzwords. Um, I th it's um, in the future when I think of human capital, I think I will look more um, at social skills, behaviors and health than just cognitive outcomes. I'm interested in tutoring. I'm interested in holidays and the dip that um, children po potentially uh, experience when holidays start and, and what that means. I'm also interested in, in the whole topic of helping with homework and how that can be achieved, the home learning. Um, when I think about how investments interact between the public and the private sphere, I think it's very important to think about information provision. How do you communicate things and perhaps how do you use new technologies? And when thinking of the role of the family background, I'm more focused now on costs and expenditure. I think um, in the context of the cost of living crisis, we can look very specifically at who has what um, to spend on children. Yeah, so that was my, my um, little talk. Thank you for listening, and um, I hope you enjoy the next one. Thank you for that really fascinating talk. And there will be an opportunity at the end, I promise, to ask a couple of questions. So we will now have two professors from the Department of Sociology who will introduce you to the incredibly diverse issues our researchers are engaging in every day. So I'll say a little bit about the Department of, uh, something about the Department of Sociology. So the Department of Sociology at the University of Essex is one of the oldest and founding departments. From the very start, the department has focused on how people think about major social issues such as poverty, inequality, class, welfare, and vulnerability in societies around the world. The department is ranked first in the UK for research environment in sociology in the government's research excellence framework, and second for research power according to the Times Higher Education. It is ranked 55th globally in the QS World University rankings by subject. Our academic staff are experts in their fields developing new theoretical and methodological approaches to understand the dynamics of social life. Their research shapes modern society today, advising the UN, government departments, think tanks, and public bodies around the world on issues from the rights of indigenous peoples to the regulation of building industry, from the impact of colonialism to tackling organized crime and terrorism. 
Our next professor to speak this evening is going to be Professor Roisin Ryan Flood from the Department of Sociology. Professor Ryan Flood is Professor of Sociology and Director of the Center for Intimate and Sexual Citizenship here at the University of Essex. Her research interests include gender, sexuality, citizenship, kinship, migration, and digital intimacy. She also has a long-standing interest in feminist epistemology and methodology. Her research takes an intersectional feminist approach. Her book, Lesbian Motherhood, Gender Families and Sexual Citizenship, was published by Palgrave in 2009 and remains the only monograph to explore lesbian parenting in a comparative perspective. She's co-editor of numerous volumes, including Silence and Secrecy in the Research Process, Feminist Reflections, published by Routledge 2010. Another book, Transnationalizing Reproduction, Third Party Concep Conception in a Globalized World, Routledge 2018. Another book, uh, Queering Methodology, Lessons and Dilemmas from Lesbians' Lives, uh, 2022 and in 2023, also from Routledge, Difficult Conversations, a Feminist Dialogue. Her research has been funded by the ESRC, the British Academy, and UCU, amongst other funders. Since 2012, Professor Ryan Flood has been a co-editor of the journal Sexualities, Studies in Culture and Society, a leading journal in the field. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Ryan Flood. Thank you. Is it this way? Perfect. Great. Thanks so much for that nice introduction, Nancy. And I'd also like to thank the organizers for this evening, especially Holly Ward. I know how much work goes on behind the scenes um, arranging events like this. And it's great to be presenting alongside two such uh, notable scholars. And also really lovely to see so many family and friends here, especially those who have travelled long distances, uh, including my wonderful parents and brother who have flown over from Dublin to be here tonight, and my lovely son who's here as well. So in this short presentation, I'm going to uh, talk about changes in intimate life that have occurred uh, in recent decades. And I'll talk about my research focus and how it's situated within the wider field of gender and sexuality studies. And then I'll draw on some examples from my own research. So I'm sure that if many of us were to compare our lives today with those of our parents or grandparents, we would notice a lot of changes that have happened in relation to intimate life. So one, of course, is that marriage rates have declined and cohabitation uh, rates have increased really dramatically and it's no longer socially stigmatized to be a co cohabiting couple in, in the way that it used to be. Uh, we've seen that divorce rates have increased compared to perhaps our parents or grandparents' generation. Um, family composition now changes more frequently across the life course. So perhaps someone might live with a partner, um, then re-partner with someone else. They might have children with different partners or stepchildren and blended families. So their definitions of who constitutes their family changes uh, across the life course. Fertility rates after the um, easily accessible introduction of contraception and abortion declined uh, until the 1980s. Assisted reproduction technologies, particularly the introduction of IVF in the 1980s, have created new kinds of uh, kinship possibilities and uh, fertility um, options for, for people, including new kinds of um, connections and relationships such as through donor conception, for example, which generates new questions about like, the rights of donor-conceived people, the rights of recipient parents, the rights of donors, and so on. And another significant change that's happened le in, within less than a decade uh, is, of course, the introduction of same-sex marriage in this country in uh, 2014, which was preceded by civil partnerships in 2004. So very, very significant to have legal recognition of same-sex couples uh, for the first time in this way. Uh, digital intimacies, we now connect with one another online. Of course, there are many family and friends around the world watching this, um, this talk and my, my colleagues' talks tonight uh, over the internet. Um, but also people doing things like online dating and creating new forms of, of connection. 
And of course, the commodification of intimacies, because many of these things involve purchasing uh, different goods and services that lead to uh, different sorts of intimate connections. Now, some theorists argue that this is all wonderful. You know, we see a transformation of intimacy, that this is a new era where people uh, experience the democratization of desire, that they're free to enter into and exit relationships at will, and it's all really, really positive. Other theorists are more skeptical, and they argue that social bonds are increasingly uh, fragile and insecure, and that we live in a social world in which consumer capitalism has infiltrated our most personal relationships and the most intimate aspects of our lives. And so people like Bauman and Elise point to something like online dating as, as an example of this, uh, as encouraging a kind of shopper mentality to the search for a partnership. Now, my own view is somewhere in the middle. I think there are lots of wonderful positive changes, but I also think that sometimes, and particularly in relation to new technologies, these present us with new ethical dilemmas and new questions about how to conduct our intimate lives in ways that um, reflect equality and um, ethical uh, kind of behavior. So for the past 20 years, I've been working in the field of what's known as the sociology of sexualities. And it feels like you know, an incredibly exciting time to have worked in this field, precisely because it's a time in which there's so much social change happening in this way. So we can think of things like, as I've already mentioned, the introduction of uh, same-sex marriage, um, an increasing demographic of uh, lesbian and gay people having children after coming out. So lesbian and gay people have always been parents, but historically they became parents in the context of a heterosexual relationship and came out later. Now we have a new generation of LGBTQ people for whom the possibility of being a parent and being openly gay is no longer incompatible. Um, you know, we see a greater visibility around trans and non-binary and gender queer people, um, also accompanied, I would argue, by a kind of moral panic around that, but still at an increased visibility. Um, at the Me Too movement has been incredibly important in articulating inequalities around sexual harassment and, and sexual abuse. Um, at the same time that we have, you know, this kind of greater visibility and awareness around inequality in these areas, uh, the global picture is still very uneven and very variable. Um, but I think that as researchers, we don't often speak about the joy of doing research. We often tend to focus on the problems of it, the challenges, uh, the difficulties we face. But for me, this has been um, a really kind of joyful journey. And one of the things that strikes me in particular is increased visibility around LGBTQ people and issues. So in a sense, my own life reflects some of these changes. So if I think about the fact that homosexuality wasn't actually decriminalized in Ireland until 1993, when I was um, a, a young teenager looking forward to starting university, to the fact that nowadays in Ireland we have same-sex marriage. I mean, that is an extraordinary shift, really, really extraordinary. And also, when I was you know, a child growing up, and that's the same for many people here, you just didn't have images of LGBTQ people in the media. That didn't actually start to shift until well into the 90s. So before then, you just didn't have lesbian and gay characters on television or in film or mentioned in social media. And it's something that media scholars have drawn attention to. And of course, that visibility is important because we you know, need to see ourselves reflected in visual culture in order to learn about the world, but also to learn about ourselves. So in a sense, I think there's something very hopeful. Even though a lot of inequality has been identified, I think... It's, that's a kind of positive message to, to take from all of this. So my research falls into three main strands. So the first of these is gender and sexual equality with particular reference to lesbian, gay, bi, uh, trans and queer rights. The second area is qualitative methods and critical epistemologies. And I always tell my students that when I was an undergraduate, my least favorite subject by a mile was methods. You know, I just found it utterly dull. And I vividly remember like having to physically hold my eyelids open in order to stay awake in class. And if you told me that I would one day go on to teach methods and write about it and publish it, I would just been horrified and thought, you know, that cannot be my future. Please do not condemn me to this. Um, but actually, I've become someone who absolutely loves methods and critical epistemologies. 
And that's because when you do work in this field, you come to understand that when you're talking about methods in epistemology, you're actually talking about questions of power and difference. And this is something that most sociologists are very interested in. Um, and that's something I'll talk about a bit more later. And then the final um, strand of my research focus is about mediated intimacies. And this is something that I've started working on in recent years. And this is how digital communication technologies transform personal relationships and add a level of intimacy to um, a wide range of relationships. Now, in my research, as Nancy mentioned earlier, I take um, what's known as an intersectional feminist reproach. And this is where inequalities across differences are incorporated into the analysis. And I'm you know, hugely grateful to post-colonial and black feminist scholars such as Chandra Mohanty and Kimberly Crenshaw, who have taught me so much about inclusivity. So for example, when we talk about the category of woman, we cannot assume that that is a monolithic category. It's always one that is going to be diverse in terms of race, class, sexuality, and so on. And I'm also deeply indebted to trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming scholars whose perspectives have also really influenced my understanding of the world. And you know, I'm thinking of people like the, um, the butch lesbian scholar Esther Newton. So all of this work has very much influenced my thinking about solidarity across difference, but also being open to critical understandings of power. And four scholars that I want to highlight in particular who've really influenced my work are um, Barbara Hobson, who you see at the, the top there. His work on gen gender families and welfare states, I first encountered as a young graduate student. And her work really opened my eyes to the role of the state in regulating social identities and possibilities, particularly for women, and also how understandings of family and kinship are embedded in social policy and social politics. Rosalind Gill, you can see a picture on the far right there, her remarkable and hugely influential work on gender and media really has transformed my understanding of how wider cultural discourses and norms shape our subjective understandings of the world and become incorporated within our own subjectivity. Um, and on the far left there, uh, Anne Phoenix is a scholar who also takes an intersectional feminist approach and really her ability to translate empirical research, you know, develop nuanced insights from that and then translate that to wider social uh, theory really leaves me in awe. And I use her work a lot in teaching as, a, as an example of how things should be done. And then finally, the late Ken Plummer, whose classic work on telling sexual stories argues that the act of telling these stories, including LGBTQ life stories, can help bring about political change. And he argued that the act of telling stories was itself part of a participatory democratic political culture. And Ken was more than a scholar whose work I admired. He was also a colleague and friend. And I always thought that if I ever had a professorial inaugural lecture, that Ken would be in the audience, you know, twinkling away. And um, he's very much missed today, as you can probably hear from my choked up voice. So writing over 20 years ago, Ken laid out a series of questions about intimate life and how they relate to rights and citizenship. And he asked, what are the many ways in which people do intimacies in the 21st century? How do we do relationships or do emotions or do bodies or genders or sexualities? What are the major changes taking place in these areas? And how deep do these changes go? And these are also questions that underline my own work and my own um, sociological projects over the last 20 years. Now, in another piece that I published recently, I asked um, some further questions. And I said, I asked, what does it mean to live a queer life specifically? And um, I asked, you know, what does it mean to inhabit the world as a queer subject? Uh, how is it different? How do you navigate outness, the closet, homophobia or biphobia or transphobia? What micro and macro aggressions are experienced? In what myriad ways are you made aware of your difference and how does that awareness seep into your conscious and unconscious self? And this is something that also very much underpins the, the many research projects that I've done over the years. So in my research, um, there are several uh, fundamental premises on which uh, my work is based. So the first of these is the social construction of sexualities. So um, 
This means that there's an understanding that sexual identities are historically and culturally specific. So what this means is that if a modern gay rights activist, for example, were to go back in time and meet someone like Michelangelo, they wouldn't necessarily have very much in common because they would understand how they conduct their intimate lives completely differently. And so there isn't any kind of essential human drive which exists beyond the inscription of culture. Now, the second kind of premise is challenging the public and private divide. So you're probably all familiar with this idea that there's a distinction, a so-called distinction, between public worlds and private lives. And in fact, sociologists have been to the forefront of challenging this idea and arguing that this is a false dichotomy. And we can look at the example I've already raised of same-sex relationships being recognized by law um, as an illustration of this. Because if you are um, not allowed by law to marry your partner or to have that relationship recognized, then that is the way in which the public world, uh, the social regulation of law and policy and so on, impacts on your private life. So they're not simply distinct areas. They're very much mutually implicated. Um, another premise of the public-private divide is the idea that public decency is constructed as inherently heterosexual, a point to which I'll return later. And then finally, the third premise underpinning my work is about challenging fixed binaries. And fixed binaries often underpin social categories. So if we think about how man and woman are constructed, not just as kind of binary oppositions, but that there's also a kind of inherent hierarchical value placed on one of those categories, which in this case is man. And we can see the same thing around race, black and white, around sexuality, straight and gay, and so on. So an important part of incorporating a kind of human rights and equality perspective into this work means challenging these kinds of binaries as oppositional categories. And another problem with having these binary oppositional categories is that they ignore the ways in which people's experiences can be far more complex than these kinds of simple uh, categorizations. In fact, many people have experiences that don't fall neatly into one category or the other. And it's really important to um, explore those nuances and complexities in order to really understand the world around us. So um, the first strand of this work about um, gender and sexual equality is something that I'll now go on to discuss. And these are some books that I've published uh, in this field. So I'll look at the first of these books uh, which was the first book I ever published about lesbian motherhood in a comparative perspective. And it, for this research, I looked at lesbians who had children after coming out. So lesbians who were conceiving children within the context of an openly lesbian lifestyle. And I did a comparative study between two European countries, uh, Sweden and Ireland. And uh, one of the really striking, at the time, it was possible to have a registered partnership similar to civil partnership in Sweden but not to have any parenting possibilities. So it was expressly stated in the law that lesbians could not foster, they could not adopt, and they could not access assisted reproduction. Now, in Ireland, you couldn't have recognition of your same-sex partnership, but you could foster and access um, assisted reproduction technologies privately. And one of the striking cross-national differences that emerged from this research was that although lesbian parents in both countries like to have a known donor, they like to know who the donor was and to impart that information to their child, um, and often the rights of adopted people's you know, rights to know their origins were cited in that, um, le lesbian parents in Sweden also chose a donor who played an active parenting role. And this reflected wider Swedish discourses about participatory fatherhood, which became incorporated into lesbian parents' reproductive decision-making and understanding of um, how they wanted to construct their family forms. So what this shows, I think, is also that lesbians are situated within specific cultural and historical contexts. And I think often LGBTQ people are treated as being outside of society, especially in research, and as almost a kind of distinct species in themselves. But I think this finding was very revealing of how lesbians both reinforced and repudiated wider discourses of kinship. And this was revealing of broader cultural understandings of kinship as well, including participatory fatherhood in a Swedish context. So this brings me to my next theme about qualitative methods and critical epistemologies. And epistemologies is basically how do we know what we know? And I think that sense of 
you know, it's really important to treat minority groups not just as interesting in and of themselves, um, you know, and to what extent they are different or as, as a sort of spectacle, but also what they reveal about wider society at large. Um, and these are some books I've published in this area. So I think it's really important not to exclude minority voices. And um, if you do so or treat minority groups only as of interest in relation to themselves and not in terms of what, how we understand wider society, I think this is another form of social exclusion and epistemic violence, and it further marginalizes minority researchers. So I want to move on to a research project that I recently completed with colleagues at PPS called Holding Hands. And we looked at public displays of affection among same-sex partners. Um, and to do this, we used a creative uh, methodology, which is known as photo voice uh, elicitation. And with this, you uh, have a particular research topic that you want to explore, in this case, um, expressions of intimacy with a, a partner, a queer partner in public. And then you invite the participants to bring images along to the interview that reflect their thoughts and perspectives uh, on this particular topic. So um, in this image here, uh, George, who's an openly gay man, talks about being in public spaces and constantly um, express, you know, experiencing a kind of hypervigilance when he's out with his partner and constantly reading the room or reading the street in order to see if it's safe to do something as simple as holding hands with his partner. And so here he has an image where they're kind of intimate together, but it's not immediately obvious to people around them that they're actually touching one another. And he says, yeah, I think that photo specifically shows that sometimes it's necessary to hide, even if you're not, even if you're proud of who you are and who you're with. And one of the things that I really like about photo voice elicitation is it allows people to articulate things that are difficult to describe. And it gives them a kind of starting point in which to articulate um, complex experiences. So here's another image from Terence, a gay man. And he talks about the fact that when he and his long-term partner were at his partner's father's funeral, which was an incredibly emotional and difficult occasion, that he didn't feel like he could sit next to his partner with his arm around him or hold his hand or anything like that because people around them would have been uncomfortable. And so he talks about, um, about this. And so he says, I just kind of grabbed his hand only very, very briefly. Now, what's interesting about that is that even when formal legal equality exists, that doesn't mean that inequality is eradicated and it still has to be navigated and this becomes part of the psychosocial experience. So this brings me to my third and final research strand, which is mediated intimacies. And I'm currently working on two projects, one of which explores online romance fraud, and I'm working with the cybercrime units of three different police forces for this. And it's also related to a wider project of mine about online dating. Um, but the second project that I'm working on at the moment explores donor conception families. And I'm looking at how people trace donors or donor relatives via unofficial channels, such as DNA testing or social media. So this year, um, it was in 2005 that the law was changed in the UK, which meant that donor-conceived people, when they turned 18, would be able to trace their donor's identity for the first time. And that first generation is turning 18 this year, so we'll see um, some of these sort of uh, contacts happening. But many people trace their donor or donor relatives through DNA testing, You've got lots of recipient parents who find other recipient parents who have used the same donor through Facebook groups that are set up around a particular um, donor number, for example. So um, just uh, here we have an image from uh, James, who is both a donor conceived person and also someone who went on to uh, become a sperm donor himself. And he talks about uh, it books as a kind of analogy for how he feels about um, being a donor conceived and being a donor. And he says, you don't hide books, you put them in the living room. Those you invite into their home can also see it. So you don't hide it in an extreme way. And he thinks that donor conceived people, they should know it's there. It shouldn't be a hidden part of life. And if they want to look at more details, they know where to find it. They, you don't force them. So it's up to donor conceived people if they want to trace this information, but it's not forced upon them, but they do have that choice. And um, this is part of a wider cultural shift discursively around the rights of donor conceived people, which is recommending uh, openness. So I'll just finish finally with uh, three quick points. 
Uh, first of all, I think that exploring diverse voices is absolutely critical to social research. I think new technologies offer new opportunities in intimate life, but they also raise potential challenges or dilemmas. And finally, changes in intimate life more broadly reflect wider social shifts and continuities in social relations of power. And I'm happy to take any questions about this, or you can reach me on email or social media. Thank you. Thank you, Roisin. Absolutely fascinating. Really, really great stuff. So our final uh, professor to speak this evening is Professor Anna Sergi. So Professor Sergi is Professor of Criminology. Her research uh, specialism is in organized crime studies, mafia mobility, drug trafficking, and comparative criminal justice. And in 2023, this year, she's visiting professor at the Australian National University in Canberra and Deakin University in Melbourne. She has published extensively in journals in criminology on topics related to Italian mafias both in Italy and abroad as well as on ports and organized crime and cross-border po uh, policing strategies. She has authored seven books. Prior to her doctorate in sociology at Essex, Professor Sergi completed a degree in law at the University of Bologna, majoring in international and European criminal procedure followed by a Master of Law in Criminal Law, uh, Criminology and Criminal Justice at King's College London. She's then, she then worked in the private sector for a short while in the Forensics and Anti-Money Laundering Department of PricewaterhouseCoopers in Milan and as Stagiare Paralegal in the Italian Desk and Litigation Department of Withers LLP in London. Very welcome, Professor Sergi. because I'm doing great. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I never really thought that I would be having a, what seems to be a very serious business, giving a professional, you know, professorial inaugural lecture. Uh, I'm the last one standing between the drinks and my talk. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of my vision board. So this is my current vision board, for also for the past. So these are the books I authored, two of which are in Italian. All of them, uh, con the ones with picture, contain my picture. That's a very recurrent thing in my research, to take pictures that I, then I can put as covers of books. Um, but seriously, I think the most important book of all uh, is Chasing the Mafia, which is my book from last year. So Chasing the Mafia is really what I'm, I'll try and talk to you about today. Um, it's uh, probably the, um, you know, breakwater uh, of my academic life. But you'll see, uh, I'll, I'll touch upon all the others because my research is all connected. Um, I'm a very, um, how can I put it, solipsistic person. I put myself at the center, so all I do is essentially to put my research around me. I absolutely adore my research. I am my research, in a way. <laughs> And I literally am my research in the sense that I, I share the roots with my research object. So I research Dendrangheta in Calabria, mostly for 80% of my time. The other 20 is ports and cocaine, which is heavily linked to Dendrangheta. Dendrangheta is the honor society, also known as the Calabrian Mafia. It's, um, it has its origin in, at the very toe of the Italian peninsula, where also I'm from. Uh, it's a very complicated uh, structure of organized crime. Uh, it has um, very uh, old origins. I don't want to bore you with the details, but the important thing is that it's today considered the wealthiest, the most successful, the most international mafias of all. So if you learn how to spell it, which is you know, already the challenge, and you Google it, <laughs> and then you set up an alarm on Google, you'll receive daily updates on the Ndrangheta, which is a happy way to wake up every morning. Um, so from home to the rest of the world is really where my research has taken me. But more importantly, I underline home. 
little um, parenthesis that maybe you don't need to know, but uh, I left Calabria when I was 18 and I never really thought uh, that I wanted to go back. I hated it. Uh, it was one of those places where nothing happened, everything was difficult, one of the poorest areas of Italy. Mafia's power was really tangible. Um, I never really thought there was nothing there. And uh, thanks to my research, uh, and mostly my research around the world, chasing the Mafia, because the, this, as I said, the Ndrangheta is present in every continent in the world, I went back home uh, and finally appreciated home in a way I never did. So that's what I say, I am my research in the sense that I grew uh, thanks to my research. I am not just a professor of criminology, I'm someone who really benefited uh, from the research I've done. And for that, I'll always be thankful to my job, which is a very, very privileged position to hold. Um, so the Ndrangheta, I just put there, just to impress you, what I study every day, pretty much. Uh, the Ndrangheta is a very st uh, complicated structure, and uh, I'm not, uh, well versed in organizational studies, but I am becoming uh, particularly interested in it. So a lot of the Ndrangheta uh, structure is rooted in what it's normal in a way in mafia studies, specialization of labor, um, diversification, ranking strategies. The ranking are the ones you'll see, if I know where is this, this thing, well, yes, here in the, um, in the names that you can see, Santista, Vangelo, these are the rankings that people, you know, achieve for various reasons. Um, and, but more importantly, I'm interested in now the expectations on what the Ndrangheta is supposed to be and has become is actually making of the organization. So I'm not just convinced, because I'm a critical criminologist, that whatever we know about the Ndrangheta is true. I actually assume the opposite. Um, so my constant challenge is to also challenge these narratives. So as I said, Ndrangheta is based in Calabria, uh, but its reach is really worldwide. Uh, and worldwide is really another perks of my job. I really travel a lot chasing the mafia, and thankfully they choose nice places. So I go to Australia, to Canada, uh, the US, uh, recently Latin America, so my research position is one of a mafia mobility scholar, um, but increasingly I'm becoming a um, cultural scholar as well. Um, so I'm gonna just give you three uh, snapshots of the tools, because obviously you, you realize researching the mafia or is, carries some sort of gravitas already as if I'm supposedly infiltrating a secret society and trying to do something with it. This is not quite what I do, but it is partially what I do, in the sense that um, classic studies on secret societies are really crucial here. Um, and I studied this, the structure of the Ndrangheta looking at families. Now looking at families, normal families, or whatever is a normal family, um, but you know, Calabrian families. So you, here are just some of the surnames, the way they are organized. And I gave you here just one family, which is, you might say, the fa my favorite family. Um, my partner says that I need a, a board in the house where I write things like, you know, um, a beautiful mind kind of thing. Uh, because that's literally what I do. I get lost in names and surname. But this family specifically is a mafia dynasty, what I call the mafia dynasty. Um, it's particularly interesting because it, it, it has it all. It's a very rich family. Uh, they engage very early on in drug trafficking. They engage very early on in kidnapping for ransom. They are behind a very ugly season of the Calabrian Mafia uh, where uh, over 200 people were kidnapped and brought back into the mountain. Um, they uh, made use, strategic use of marriages. Uh, so they are intermarried with basically everyone who lives in the village. The village they live in is very, very small and very, very poor but they also migrated quite a lot. And we uh, have a time, which is the 80s, where members of this family are heading a cell of the Ndrangheta in different places. So we have the Italian cell, with a name who's particularly important for the evolution of the national uh, structure of the Ndrangheta. Someone in Australia who was his brother, their cousin in the north of Italy, and two other cousins in Hamilton, Canada, um, 
uh, and at the time also in Toronto was covered. So looking at what this looks like is uh, an incredibly interesting uh, challenge uh, because it means looking at migrant families, which are obviously taking a different form. It means looking at transculturation, what happens when we are at the third generation and many of these uh, communities are becoming integrated. I mean, we are talking about Australia, we are talking about Canada. So obviously these are Canadian, uh, Australian people who are also Calabrian. So I had to engage with all the literature there that looks at transculturation, which is the stratification of cultures in migrant setting and also in family setting, which is also interesting. Uh, this led me, for example, to challenge the um, uh, narrative around transnational organized crime in the first place. What even is of transnational organized crime if not a range of uh, structures that take context and opportunity in a, and, and exploit it in certain ways. So obviously this um, the other side, so if this is related to the structure of Dendrangheta, another very important, let's say, advancement of my research uh, in addition to mafia mobility, has been looking at cocaine trafficking. Now, I haven't said it yet, but it might not surprise anyone to know that the Ndrangheta families, uh, some of the Ndrangheta families made their fortune with cocaine trafficking. They are the most important cocaine traffickers of Italy and of the southern European, uh, uh, let's say, regions, uh, some of the most important traffickers of Europe. So, in, in that sense, they represent a particularly important starting point to study something else, which is cocaine trafficking. Now, when I approach cocaine trafficking to study mafia, I made a very smart decision. I always congratulate myself for that decision, which is to leave the mafia out. So I, I designed a research project, which was eventually funded by the British Academy, uh, and that looked at ports and organized crime for the purposes of cocaine trafficking, but centering it on ports. And centering it on ports, which are gates, they are borders, and they are incredibly invisible spaces, really led me to, again, dismantle the narrative of transnational organized crime, reconsider some of the things we already knew from political economy anyway, about uh, how maritime shipping really works, and to what extent, very little extent, anyone can control anything in the maritime shipping world. So this research has been fantastic because it brought me to really feel my um, uh, iPhone with 700 million pictures uh, of ports. Uh, I don't know if you've ever thought about ports, but I've, I don't know what I was doing in my previous life, but I definitely have an attraction to containers and ports and it's, it's fascinating. Uh, so that port there um, is also going back home. This is the port that I saw growing up. Uh, that's the port of Gioia Tauro, which is notoriously known as the Drangheta port, meaning um, about 56% of cocaine that arrives into Italy arrives here. So it's a particularly important port for many reasons. Um, so obviously looking at cocaine trafficking, um, it's, it's a huge task. And the only task, the only way I could do it was to study ports and to really center it. And studying port has been an investment for the future. It's one of those research strands that I can never let go because it took me so long to understand the technicalities of the port economy that it would be very foolish of me to not pursue it again. So that's where my research is also going, forgetting the mafia in a way and moving towards other things. So for example, right now I'm very interested in ports, cocaine, Ireland and Northern Ireland. Uh, and if you want to know more, you ask me afterwards because I don't have time. Um, the last part of my research, which is the most theoretically challenged, uh, challenging, I mean, I, I read a lot uh, like every academic does, or I try to when I have the time, um, but this one really is uh, the last bit of my, uh, you know, being a mature professor, as they say. Uh, which is the trying to understand um, how to explain certain, in certain environments um, how institutional actors have merged with Ndrangheta clans or Ndrangheta members um, <coughs> and somehow also embedding economic, economic actors and also, because we can't just do it you know, in an easy way, 
deviant Masonic lodges um, and eventually what the prosecutors call the invisibles, which by the way, if you're calling them invisibles and you see them, they are not really invisible. So, you know, that kind of poses another question there. So my latest book, which is um, on mafia corruption and uh, deviant Masonic lodges, uh, which in this case I co-authored because, uh, you know, it's a massive undertaking, really asked me to go back to the original question of mafias, which is what is the power of mafia? And obviously you can understand here that engaging with concept of power is really a daunting, daunting task. So what we have been doing here for this other side is really to question um, not just power in its formulas and how it manifests and the interactions that corruption might uh, yield in a specific area. I always tend to focus on community studies because that's easier for me to picture. But um, it led me to reconsider some studies on recognition and social recognition of phenomena. And here we go really back to philosophy, not really just uh, so social sciences. So the social recognition, the power of constitution, the constitutive power of social recognition and what other people expect externally from um, a certain type of um, power structure is as strong as the power structure itself. So in the recent parts of my research, I've been looking at um, many different things that relate to this. Um, which have to do, for example, with a, a part of the Ndrangheta structure which evolved into some sort of paramasonic lodge uh, that used all the narratives from the masonic, the real masonic lodges, to um, essentially instill in others the expectation of secrecy and power. So it's a particularly complicated thing to explain in a very short period of time, but um, I hope I'm making myself sort of clear uh, when I say that obviously this has to do with very deep concepts such as secrecy, such as power, such as um, not even mafia. Mafia is already a very loaded word, but um, politics in a certain way. So. This latest research, so for this book, which is coming out in 2023, so in the, in the next few months, uh, essentially we wanted to create that and to use uh, social constructionism, uh, symbolic interaction, and so very classic social theories, um, together with some economic theories, uh, economic sociology theories, um, to an organizational studies as well, to look at what exactly constitute power, how is power made? And by made, I don't mean truly made, I, made I, I mean actually constituted even in the narratives. So I'm not concerned anymore with any kind of truth about the mafia. I don't care if it is true or not, not just the mafia, but everything around it. I'm concerned with the external and internal ways in which this gets narrated and this gets actually constituted and it becomes the reality. Uh, so. To finish off uh, my research advancement, I take a lot of pride in reintroducing a cultural approach to organized crime studies uh, and adding a behavioral approach to organized crime and mafia studies. Uh, you might not be aware of it, hopefully you aren't because why would you, but um, there has been a time when looking at mafias as subcultures was okay and then all of a sudden it wasn't okay. What happened in between was that the mafias moved most notably to the United States and they became Italian mafia. So the ethnic um, addition to a war that was already charged became discrimination and created the so-called ethnicity trap. Who, they are Italian organized crime, they must be mafia. Assuming that everyone who was in, involved in some sort of organized crime had to be part of the mafia. So this deterministic um, approach had various, <laughs> created various problems for policy, for sure, for policing, but also in academia, because some of my earlier colleagues decided, liberal colleagues, to avoid the ethnic trap, went the other way around and said, okay, this, there is no culture here, there is no, nothing to do with ethnicity, this is pure business, which is also something that is quite complex to, and we don't see this in reality. Um, so. Uh, it's very difficult to do this, and I'm in a minority position, 
in this, but now that I have the professor title, at least I can shout louder. Um, I pioneer mafia mobility research in Australia. That is still something that I'm questioning whether I should have done that, because it attracts all sorts of weird um, attention to my research. Uh, but it's been, uh, I'm still the only researcher who studies Italian mafias in, the, in, in Australia, and it's a very challenging um, research to do, uh, because there is quite a lot to do. Um, I revitalize research on poor security, illicit trade and corruption with a focus on complex crime. I'm trying to break down with the organized crime label, which is too strict and it doesn't quite fully comprehend what I'm observing, especially the power dimension. Uh, and research on poor security was scarce, uh, it's still quite scarce because it's very difficult also to, uh, to get um, uh, you know, uh, access. Uh, but um, revitalizing this also helped me to reconnect with colleagues around the world who are doing this research and it's particularly interesting to compare ports, which is, you know, something we do, apparently. Um, and because I get bored very soon and very often, apart from publishing, um, I also have invested a lot into impact. And impact, for those of you who don't know it, it's a very English concept, I think, uh, impact in research. In the sense that you are not just supposed to disseminate your research, you're supposed to change the world. And it's, it's a great challenge. It's a great challenge to have, and it's something that eventually makes you wonder, why the hell am I doing this? If not to change the world, a little bit. So impact, um, which is very much where I go back to my roots and go back to being the kind of, um, person that is mostly connected to a southerner culture of trying to make relationship, trying to nurture relationship, trying to really put everyone you talk to at the center of attention. And in this social, social science methodology really helped me a lot. So my relationship with uh, police forces, with Interpol, with Europol, everyone I've talked to in my research is really the key to the success of my impact which eventually was part of my journey to become a professor as well, because obviously having impact um, early on in your research is already a good indication that your research is not necessarily good enough for academic standards, but definitely understandable enough for, um, you know, for actually making a change or trying to make a change. And the future challenges, as I said, I, I don't make my life easier in terms of uh, focusing only on one thing. I'm never convinced that you can explain complex things only with one lens, it's impossible. So in interculturality and intercultural studies or even in the sense transcultural studies are really where I am now in terms of my mafia mobility research, uh, the intergenerational implication of mafia mobilities, which is something that is very um, even is difficult for law enforcement to grasp and for our, from our perspective to explain. Um, and this is the minority, as I said, it's the minority of organized crime studies. Organized crime studies is very focused on the activities, on the economy, on the business side, on how to basically take back the proceeds of crime, of organized crime. And for some reason that doesn't interest me, that's someone else's job. Um, methodological challenges, I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, and I'm very, very proud of owning them. And my book, Chasing the Mafia, is also about owning my mistakes. I was underprepared when I, when I went for the first time in 2014, I think it was, uh, in Australia. I wasn't ready to do the research I did. Um, and then I reflected a lot. I published an article on it, which is actually called um, uh, doing um, involuntary ethnography uh, and uh, stumbling upon places and culture, because that's literally what I did. Um, and that, I think, helped me quite a bit in my journey uh, as, a, as a researcher, as a reflective researcher. I'm very much against, and this is something that I feel very strongly uh, about, I'm very much against polishing up our research and making it look like it's always perfect. It is not. At least in criminology, it cannot be. So this is something that I strive to teach and I strive to communicate in ethics board, in um, you know, methodology classes. You can, you can predict as much as you want, but this is messy. And only by reflecting things on things afterwards, during, before, talking to colleagues, talking to mentors, then we can actually make our research worthwhile. 
but to polishing up as we do in research articles where this is what I did, this is how I did my research. That's, to me, that's a fiction that I'm very much hoping that I get to contribute to this mantle a little bit. Um, I'm not scared by my, no, my minority and critical position in criminology. That's what Essex is here for. All my colleagues are pretty much that. So we are a fantastic uh, department for, and for critical studies. Um, and obviously achieving more impact requires a lot of dedication and travel. The university really allowed me to, as much as obviously it's possible, to move around a lot uh, and to, do, to arrange my research around also my impact and uh, my need to travel, obviously. Uh, I'm going to Australia next uh, month for the break. Um, so obviously, wish me luck, wish me energy for sure. And if you really have questions, ask. Thank you. I think we don't want to wish you any more energy. That was really great and fantastic and very stimulating and, and fascinating and really enlightening, really fantastic three talks which were just showed the passion coming, coming out of you for your subject. I will allow us to have three questions, one for each of the three professors would be really lovely and then we'll, we'll sort of be able to sort of go to the sort of garden wing and have a nice, uh, a nice reception. Any questions? Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, and it's to any three. Okay. Um, what advice would you give for early careers or um, young people that want to go in the academic career to uh, be as successful as we proved you have been so far? <laughs> Brigitte? You want to have a go? Shall we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've not taken a short route, so I, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this because I've gone a little bit like this. But I would say do what you're interested in and what you're passionate about and then you do it well because I don't think there's any other way to do it. Just um, choose something that you really like. I don't even know who asked this question. But um, that's yes. all I can think of right now. Excellent. Another question from anyone? Sure, there are many burning questions, but people just want to have a nice little drink in their hand when they're doing it. So I'll take this opportunity to also make a plug for our next professorial inaugural lectures, which will be on Wednesday, 15th of March, from the Faculty of Science and Health. And we're going to hear from two professors there from the School of Life Sciences. So I will just then end by welcoming you to join us to our winter garden to have um, some drinks, but most importantly, to really say a huge thank you for our three really, really life-changing women. I'm so happy I am the inclusion champion for gender. So it's a really very honor, great, great honor for me to sort of be saying thank you very much to three really distinguished women professors. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>